You're kidding me. In the gazebo under a clear autumn sky. A bell chimes. Now, let's go ahead and know Nick and Mikado Sam's birthday party. And Ibishi couldn't get the party started. Happy birthday! Here's my present. A frog ornament! My, my own personal recommendation. Mr. Frog, will wake you up. Thank you. I'm so happy we've all come together to throw such a wonderful party for me. I'll truly treasure the presents. She smiles at her fellow classmates and her underclassmen hand her gifts. What the heck? They planned a surprise party? Looks like Kanabishi san is the organiser, but she hasn't given me a single role. This is from me. It's not much, but. Oh, my favourite flower! Press them to a bookmark! Just a kind of gift I expect from a book lover like you, Shirohane san. I hope you like it. So he comes with the cheeks flush at nervous gratitude. Marching over, I insert myself into a pretty picture. I'm the only one who's commenting handed. I look like a real asshole. Good day, Atsu Senpai. Oh, Senpai? You haven't bought your present? Why would I want to even know you'd throw in your party? You wouldn't be surprised if I told you. Why would you want to surprise me? Now I. Oh, you're Gaki san, Gaki Saki san. You both came too. The president invited us. As she speaks, she hands over her own paper wrap package. What the hell? From a size and heft of it, it looks expensive. Since you're in a choir club, we've got you a digital metronome. It's perfect for improving your rhythm. I've never seen one of those before. Do you even know you could get digital ones? I use one myself. This is my spare. I hope that's okay. Thank you, Jackie Saki san. Yeah, Jackie san. So lovely having so many people to celebrate with. You're a natural people magnet, Kamikado Senpai. Do we get anyone else at the academy will see this many presents, right, Jatsu Senpai? Screw you. That's what I yell internally, but I don't know, be mean best friend, I say. Happy birthday, Neri. Thank you, Yuzu Hassan. I wanted to tell her when we were alone. Ah, Kamikado Senpai, there you are. Since you're a birthday girl, we need you to cut the cake. Before that, you're an important undertaking, blowing out the candles. Oh my word, you made a ginormous cake just for me? Richan sounds not a piece. Okay, let's go, go. One of the twins takes her each by the arm, sandwiching her between them. My own cake pales in comparison to Hanabishi Kun's impressive creation. Sorry for making fun of you. Sorry. She didn't mean to be mean, she's a terrible person. <laughs> oh, I love that pair. As watching other students, both are aged and younger. And clearly adore Neri. It's fine. Um, her blue green eyes regard me uneasily. I know that deep down, our cute little underclassman is actually a very nice, caring person. Things might not go according to my plan, but I've also gotten to see how loved Neri is. That does make me genuinely happy. There's still time to change your plan and surprise her later. Yeah, you're right. Thanks. I have to think about it. I smile with my cynical smile, a concerning expression finding morphs back into a usual disdainful one. You're a good person, Yatsuro Senpai. I wish you'd say that in a louder voice and with more people. My comment seems to reassure Takisaki Kun too. Then he blows out the candles in one breath to a resounding cheer. I watch as my friend's porcelain cheeks flush and feel my chest grow warm. I'm gonna go with some coffee. Do you two want some? Yes, please. I'll take an Americano. There's no espresso. Takisaki could ask me what the difference is, and Erika explains that an Americano is basically a watered down espresso. With sideline glance at them, I make my way over to a drinks table. Please, have some cake. My teacher, who's hanging out a slice of cake, calls out to me with an internal sigh. I veer away from my patch of coffee and head over to her instead. So, Kun. Are you free later? Yes, why? 
I like to talk in private. Whispered to her to come meet me at a specific place following dinner, and head back to the table to get my coffee. It wasn't an accident, I declare. It was, it said, but yeah, hours darkest before the dawn. The Twilight Lobby. Oh, I like that word. The Twilight Lobby. Is Twilight a word? It should be. Oh, sorry, missed the rest of it. The Twilight Lobby is silent as a grave. Fol folding my words and its still embrace. The area is heavy with a cold tango of mid autumn, and I feel a chill creeping up from my soles and my feet. Standing beside the aquarium, but her eyes aren't focused on my brightly coloured fish as they went wind, wind their way through the water. Yet we aren't set on me either. The train down on the dim floor, bowed like that, looks as though she's lamenting many troubles. It wasn't an accident. She doesn't move from her position, even when I repeat the words. Nor did she ask me what I'm talking about. So as your honey son already knows. I'm talking about the incident in the textiles room with a shapeshifter. That was no accident. My theory was wrong. No, you were right about what she was doing, that she was working alone in the textiles room, and the victim herself was the one who locked the door. And you were right about the fact she ripped her friend's dress. Like I told you, it was an accident. She falls silent. It's a blank stretch of time after dinner, when all we other students return to their rooms for prayers. The cold permeating my skin seems to freeze the air between us and the otherwise deserted lobby. Everything occurred just as you said. But the look for a motive is basic element for deduction. Why did the murderer kill so and so? But of course, because the incident was attributed to a shapeshift of the dorms, one of the score seven mysteries, that train of thought was never followed. After all, supernatural beings don't need logical motives. But since this isn't an accident we're talking about, let's go to with our ghost too. Just that window, as if it wasn't a supernatural being. That means it was a flesh and blood person. You're saying there was no shapeshifter? She's not asking about the existence of a creature, she's asking for her saying Shabaki kun never saw the shapeshifter as she claimed. Right. You said she fainted from the fright of seeing a shapeshifter, of seeing herself, but a shapeshifter never appeared to her at all. Going to clarify, she used a shapeshifter with dorms to her advantage. As you know, there are no mirrors in the textiles room. She had closed the curtains while working there after hours. So there's no way she could have seen herself. Fear sometimes causes people to see things that aren't there. Yeah, that does happen, but not in this case. She wasn't ever in a fragile state of mind. This is where motive comes in. Her face clouds over her words. It will reveal the reason she's coming for Suabukikun. The reason I feel like something doesn't seem right when I was domesticating was just that. Motive. And there wasn't any. However, when you take the question of motive into account, it suddenly becomes obvious. I tell her how it met with Dorm of Katabami that morning from Miss Peck with dress again. And why it was taunted with suspicious. The dress was torn in one single line straight down from the colour. That doesn't make sense if she had as you said. She grabbed hold of it when she lost her balance. Then... But how else would it have been torn? Upon further inspection of her dress, a small notch torn into a fabric to make it easier to tear with scissors. Did you...? Let's out a heavy sign to her face of her proof thrust before her. So if your honey already knows the truth, she knows it all, but... Yes. She didn't remember by accident. So Vicky could rip her friend's dress on purpose. So I could have known so Vicky Kun was a culprit all along. But she's kept quiet. She's still staring down at her feet, not looking at me in the face. I heard something really interesting a while back about the students who transferred into your class. I heard about the three women in love triangle. I knew it. I knew I didn't forget, didn't forget that. That was just a rumour. There's no smoke around fire. It's been corroborated, unfortunately. It seems that Suobikikun was one of the three girls that tangled in the Amity partnership. Suobikun doesn't even nod. I know it's painful for her, but I can't stop. The situation was resolved with Suobikun being one left broken hearted. 
When I looked into it a little further, it was obvious that the torn dress belonged to one of Super Yugen's empty partners. The girl who was stolen in love from her. She probably... As she was working late at night, her eyes fell in love while she was dressed. A small but violent flame of jealousy was lit. She took her scissors, made a slit in the fabric. Bearing projecting my past self onto Super Yugen. Onto her three transfer students in a love triangle. And ripped it apart. I go on to suggest that since she hadn't gone into the intention of ripping her dress, she'd probably freaked out. It wasn't premeditated, it was a slow and moment thing. And she wanted to destroy the dress, there was plenty of ways she could have gone about it without getting caught. And then, while she was wondering what to do, you arrived. Going by a timeline, she probably only realised you were there and you came back from the door and looked at the farm according to your story. The first time you only tried the doorknob. At first time, so Bukikun was preoccupied with the wrong she just committed. I didn't notice the sound of a doorknob being turned. You only tried calling through the door when you returned to the door mother, didn't you? Yes, that's what occurred to me, the door was just locked. But someone locked it from the inside. You knocked on the door and called out, that's when Tsubuki could finally realise she was cornered. She had the idea of pinning the blame on the shapeshifter, who had been spotted frequently in the same room. Well, you know, had a breath of my long speech, so I couldn't lift her beautiful eyes looking in her face. Those cruel dark eyes filled with sorrow and resignation. You realised it was all a ruse as soon as you entered the room and saw Tsubuki pretending to be unconscious, didn't you? You trotted out your theory to me, so no one would get hurt by the truth. She intentionally misled me and Hanabishi-kun. I saw myself in Tsubiki san in those three. She reveals the inner feelings I had vowed not to ask her about. There's nothing I could say in response. Her love triangle reminded me of us. If we hadn't been able to deal with our feelings, then perhaps she would have done something like Tsubiki-kun. It would have been imprudent of me to make her say what she's talking about. Tsubiki-kun so stares at me imploringly. Then with glistening eyes still fixed on mine, she moves in closer. So, yeah, show senpai please. I'm captured by those un upturned eyes, her doll-like features, her slender frame, her gorgeous raven tresses so black they blend in the darkness surrounding us. I have to report this. It's true, senpai. Otherwise I have to cancel the Halloween party. As president of the council of Kaya, I can't let that happen. I see, yes, of course. However, I reach out and touch her beautiful silky hair. One of the many things about her I envy. The story of report is this basket is the one you told me. Is that okay? Of course it is not. But if I told her the truth, we wouldn't expect secrecy from Sister Basket. So Bukikun and the others would face consequences. Play with strands of hair between my fingers as Suikun continues to gaze at me. It's also my job as present to protect the students. I give Suikun and the others a talking to myself, of course. Thank you, Yatsura Senpai. She wraps her arms around me and hugs me, and my pulse quickens. It's not like I come to expecting this, but a hug from the most gorgeous girl in school is a welcome perk. As much as I'd like to keep enjoying the feeling your arms around me, or she was probably going to be coming out of her rooms any time now. I gently remove myself from the embrace. Her cheeks flush crimson. She's so cute. I'm going to go report to Sister Basket now. Thank you. Sure thing. Once it's all wrapped up, we'll make it difficult for shapeshifters to show up again. Don't mean you'll disappear completely? It's just my personal opinion, but I suspect the rumors about shapeshifters appearing in the textile room stem from people going round to the lights out. It's a means of keeping other people clear. I walk over to the aquarium. It's called the shapeshifter of dorms, right? Meaning it's a creature that pops up all over a dormitory building. It, isn't even, it didn't even appear in the textiles room. The fish carry curiosity to the real side of the glass. They probably think I'm going to feed them. Instead, I gently tap on the glass with my finger. Did you know that fish sleep? But that told me. Seems wary of sudden changing topics, but follows me over to my gaze of a tank too. They sleep? I've never seen a sleeping fish. They have the lights out off them. It's not like they can flick a switch themselves when it's night. It's important to turn them off at a regular schedule. Is that so? 
Be special on a regular light out schedule too. Exactly 11:30 p.m., which is night time round. Dorma Makatabami comes to the lobby and turns on the lights. Press the switch as I speak. The glass tank becomes a mirror. I reckon this is probably the origin of my shapeshifter. My face and silicon and startled visage stand out in a sharp relief in black glass. A flash of sardonic smile around my reflection. The world is interesting because of all things you go through it, in it. And meeting others is fun because of all the different people there. I'll drop by Sir Baker Kun's room and speak with her and our auntie partners. But that we'll have to wait for another time. So until then, have a wonderful day. Bye bye. <laughs>